I, w I wanted to start out also by thanking uh, everyone for the, the invitation, um, especially Samuel, whom I've, I've been in touch with most. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, I should also explain I'm a philosopher by discipline. And when I say philosopher, I mean I do, I do Anglo-American analytic philosophy, which is um, maybe fairly distinctive. So that's the approach I have. Um, I try to apply moral theory to particular cases in the real world and make moral judgments uh, using these theories. This paper is not very theoretical, um, but it uses uh, concepts that engage with moral theory very clearly. In fact, because it's so obvious in some ways what's wrong, uh, you don't need a lot of theory uh, at the moment. So look, here, this is the outline. I have a few claims that I'm going to be making. Um, and, and these are the main ones. Um, first, uh, digilante pedophile hunting is much more questionable morally than undercover policing of pedophiles in a liberal democracy. And, and here I think uh, the contrast with the previous paper is very great because you'll see that the liberal democratic framing of what is a, a acceptable pedophilia hunting uh, is, is quite different from what we've been hearing about in Russia. Um, and then I wanted to say, too, that digilante pedophile hunting is much more questionable morally than another kind of uh, digilantism called scam baiting. Indeed, the two things are so different that many of the models that have been applied so far to digilantism in this conference perhaps don't apply, uh, at least straightforwardly, to scam baiting. I'll come to, for people who don't know what scam baiting is, I'll come to it um, as, as we go along. One of the things I want to say about scam baiting, uh, you know, contrary perhaps to what Daniel has, has been talking about, is that scam baiting does not weaponize visibility. Though there is a, there is a, a kind of visible aspect to the targets of scam baiting, uh, making those targets visible does not seem to me to be the, the main thing. So in some ways, it's kind of non-standard. Uh, digilantism and interesting for that reason, at least in this conference. Now, I'm going to start with uh, pedophile hunting, and in order to frame the, the discussion, I, I need to talk about a, a small piece of legislation from England and Wales. You know that in, uh, in the United Kingdom we don't have a unitary jurisdiction. We have England and Wales on the one hand, and we have a Scottish jurisdiction on the other. And this is a piece of legislation that applies in England and Wales. Um, it's called the Sexual Offenses Act 2003, and we're, we're interested in an offense that's described in Section 15. So Section 15 criminalizes the act of meeting a child after grooming. And here are some of the conditions. The offender has to be over 18, and they must have met or communicated with the, with the child at least twice. And the offender has to have intended to meet the child and travel to the meeting intending to commit one of a range of offenses that are specified in the first part of this Sexual Offenses Act. So there has to be an intention to commit rape or to commit some other kind of assault um, that's mentioned in the rest of this act. Um, it's very important that, that uh, this, this piece of legislation distinguishes between offenses committed against children who are 16 and, um, and under 16 and uh, children who are under 13. Uh, that distinction is very important to the way undercover policing works in the UK as well. So offenses under Section 15 are punishable by a maximum of 10 years imprisonment uh, but uh, rarely uh, are sentences that long. Um, and I should say that the, the conviction rate for um, uh, charges on, under this act are over 90% because the, the chat logs, the evidence is so compelling. Um, there's an, uh, an amendment to this act that was introduced this year uh, that criminalizes uh, an area that is pre, uh, so to speak, uh, meeting of the child. That's to say, sexualized conversation itself is criminalized by a new uh, 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 bit of the Sexual Offenses Act that was introduced this year. Um, another thing that's interesting about um, Section 15 is that it criminalizes um, 
acts that are committed in other jurisdictions, uh, which, is, which is strange. So for example, if you uh, arrange online to meet a child in Thailand, and you do meet the child in Thailand, and you come back to the UK, you can be arrested under Section 15 for that. That's very interesting, the international reach of, uh, of uh, Section 15. So this is the act that governs the police um, in uh, grooming and meeting. Um, another feature of Section 15 that I, I emphasize in other work I do is that Section 15 criminalizes a preparatory offense. Grooming is not considered sexual assault, um, but criminalizing uh, grooming, uh, meeting after grooming, that's criminalizing a preparatory act. And within academic legal literature, especially in the UK, it's very controversial whether there should be um, preparatory offenses. This is especially the case in, uh, in terrorism legislation, but the UK is full of preventive legislation and preventive orders are very, very widely used for a whole range of crime. And the fact that, there, that grooming is brought into it um, is interesting because grooming and uh, meeting a child after grooming, criminalizing that, seems very defensible even if other preparatory offenses are not. Are you with me? So, so this offense is interesting for a defense of, of uh, criminalization of preparatory acts. And I do engage in that um, defense in other papers. OK, so let's talk about undercover policing of grooming um, in, uh, in, in the UK. There are two kinds of undercover policing that I want to discuss. They're quite similar to one another, but morally, the difference is very important. So the first kind of undercover policing operation works like this. A child under 13 is being groomed by a pedophile online. The, the parents of the child discover that the child is being groomed. They call the police. The police uh, intervene by taking over the identity of the child. Now, um, I've been involved in a project that uses software to simulate the identity of the child. Uh, that software depends on semantic profiling of chat log uh, entries, chat log discussions. So the linguistic mannerisms of children um, are very peculiar to individuals, and those mannerisms can be profiled using big data, and the uh, results of that uh, enable you to, tr to speak in a, in a child's voice, in fact, in anyone's voice, online. That software is just being commercialized now, and it, in this project it was trialed with the police. So that's the way it works. The police assume the identity of the child. Are you with me? And then the, uh, the conversation between groomer and then the police is very carefully controlled. The police are very careful not to introduce further sexualized conversation from their side. They are very careful never to propose a meeting with the groomer. The invitation to meet has to come from the groomer themselves. You understand that there's a chat log. That chat log will be used as evidence. If the police introduce the invitation to meet, that would be entrapment and the prosecution would fail. So there, it's very carefully orchestrated. On the other hand, the conversation has to be conducted in such a way that the, police are very, that the uh, groomer is very explicit about wanting to have sex. So when the groomer suggests a meeting, um, the, the police suggest a place where a safe arrest can be made. Uh, that's to say an arrest where, where, where someone can't escape and where other people won't be um, affected uh, by the arrest. Um, once the arrest is made, an order is issued to the police that enables them to search the computers of the person arrested. Uh, for uh, child pornography. When um, those uh, computers are searched, um, they often find uh, images of children, indecent images of children within the meaning of the act, and uh, further charges are brought because of the uh, indecent images on the computer. So usually there'll be two charges. <coughs> One is meeting a child after grooming, and the other is um, uh, distributing or having indecent images. 
and then there'll be a prosecution, and as I said, the conviction rate is very, very high, over 90, 90%. Now that's one model. That's the assuming the identity of the child model. But here's another model, and this is much more common in, in pedophile hunting. In the other model, the police invent the persona of a child. There is no child. They invent the persona, they distribute the persona on a chat room that they know pedophiles visit. The, the groomer approaches the persona, and then thereafter it develops in exactly the same way as the first uh, type of, of grooming. It goes right to the arrest, everything is exactly the same. Now the first claim I want to make is that the first kind of uh, pedophile hunting on the part of the police is better morally than the second. And the reason it's better morally is because in the first case, there's a real child who might suffer harm, and that harm is being prevented by the initial police operation. Also, there's less deception in the first case than in the second case. It's true that in the first case, the police pretend to be a child whose identity they have assumed, but they don't create the child, so to speak. They don't create the child persona. In the case where they do create the child persona, it's at least arguable that but for what the police did, no crime would have been committed. Do you see what I mean? Because of the time when the police intervene. For those reasons then, um, it's clear in my uh, view, and I can support this with theory, but I don't think it's necessary, it's clear that um, uh, undercover policing method one is superior to undercover policing two. Now, the rest of my argument is very simple. Every single kind of uh, informal uh, digital pedophile hunting is worse than police method number two. And the reason it's worse than police method number two is that pedophile hunters do not observe the constraints of not entrapping the um, uh, the, the groomer. On, on the contrary, in many cases um, that I've seen, they are very, very proactive in encouraging the groomer, in, se in sexualizing the conversation, and in uh, pretty much speeding up the, the process of, of getting to the meeting. And what happens, of course, as, as, as has already been said, there's, there's quite a lot of similarity uh, to, to what's been described already. Um, when um, an amateur pedophile hunter arranges a meeting uh, with a pedophile, um, the, uh, the, the, the meeting will be filmed. Um, there'll be a lot of criticism of the uh, pedophile. There usually isn't very much violence, if any. Uh, the prize for the pedophile hunter is the image of the shamed, humiliated person. And in my experience of um, uh, pedophile hunting uh, groups, there is no connection that I know of with any nationalist right-wing uh, political program of any kind. On the contrary, I think of it as an extension of gaming. You know, uh, there are people who, who uh, think pedophilia is wrong, and they engage in a game in which they win if the pedophile comes to the meeting, and the, they lose if the pedophile is frightened off. And there isn't, there isn't a, the political uh, program uh, that's just uh, uh, been described. Now, um, the, the kind of claim that I want to make in this part of the paper is that because of the moral inferiority of uh, digital uh, pedophile hunting, it is, it is better for the digital pedophile hunting to be constrained by police. And uh, that is something that happens with some kind of pedophile hunting. In the UK, there has recently been an announcement on the part of the police that they are willing to consider cooperation with pedophile hunters. They've never done that before. In the paper, I talk about um, the uh, pedophile hunting group Perverted Justice, which is a very famous group in the United States. Um, now, uh, uh, pedophile, Perverted Justice um, has a, a short history. It started out as an amateur group 
a very small amateur group that consisted of one person uh, tempting a pedophile uh, to, to propose a meeting. The meeting place was that person's home. Uh, the pedophile came to the home and he got beaten up um, or sometimes only chastised. Um, and what perverted justice has become is a very large uh, online operation that compiles chat logs with um, uh, pedophiles. Uh, in an earlier stage of perverted justice, those chat logs were publicized. Um, part of the way that the chat logs were compiled was for the pedophile to identify himself, uh, it's almost always a man, and give identifying details at the stage at which that was done, uh, those chat logs were, were given to, the, to forums, uh, forums from the public using uh, those chat logs. Uh, those people in the forums were invited to get in touch with the, uh, the pedophile and shame him or tell their family and friends and so on. So it's rather like a, a farming out of the functions that we've heard about in Russia. Instead of the pedophile group doing all of that, um, the general public was invited to get involved and to do that. Well, um, I think it's quite obvious that, that um, this digital uh, pedophile hunting uh, runs the many kinds of risks. One risk is mistaken identity. Because if, if somebody um, is identified as perverted, by perverted justice as a pedophile and he has a common name, it's very easy for someone with the same name, for example, to be beaten up or for his reputation to be ruined and so on. I've already mentioned the, the, the problem with entrapment. And there are many, many other uh, problems um, that are to do with injustice that this kind of vigilantism shares with vigilantism. So, I, I think I'm implying that the normal, uh, the normal moral prohibitions or moral and political philosophy prohibitions on digilantism are basically sound and that digilantism needs a strong justification if it's going to be legitimate at all morally. Okay, now that suggests that the only way in which, uh, in which uh, um, digital pedophile hunting could be more or less uh, legitimized is if it's uh, done in conjunction with the police under legal constraints that allow prosecutions to be made as opposed to simple shaming. And that's what perverted justice does now. Perverted justice hands over chat logs to local police, the police local to the pedophiles, the police prosecute, and when the prosecutions are over, the relevant chat logs are published and perverted justice pats itself on the back for getting another conviction. And there are many convictions. Um, everybody can just, uh, you know, Google perverted justice and you get their web page. You can have a look at, um, at the way they do that. It's not a very good website, I've got to say. Now, I want then to, to, to talk about the, the difference between pedophile hunting and scam baiting. Uh, these are two quite different um, types of vigilantism. So um, scam baiting happens when um, people who are known to be scammers are attracted to a chat room or to some other online platform. It could be a trading platform. It could be any number of other platforms than a chat room. And people uh, give their contact details with the, the idea of attracting scammers uh, to try to scam them. And when uh, scammers do approach them, um, they, uh, they go to a lot of trouble to waste their time and to prolong the, the, the fraud for as, as, as much time as possible. So in other words, when a scammer approaches and says, um, um, I can give you a million pounds in your bank account if you only give me 50,000 now, um, instead of saying, uh, here, uh, take 50,000, they say, well, I'll have to talk to my bank about it. And then they talk to their bank and there's a delay and then there's another delay and another delay and another delay and the scammer gets very angry and <coughs> frustrated. And that's the point of scam baiting. Scam baiting is the weaponization of frustration on the part of bad people. Um, there is a, a, um, 
a scan baiting site that I use in the paper, that I mention in the paper, which is called 419 Eaters. Th this, is a, um, uh, this is a website that's connected to the 419 scam. The 419 scam is the offer of a, of a large amount of money in your bank account if you pay some advance charges. That's a scam that originates in West Africa. And uh, many of the people who participate in the scam are from Nigeria and Ghana. If you look at 419 Eaters, there is a part of the 419 Eaters website where you have pictures of the scammers. And the, the scammers are often holding up signs that are ridiculous with inscriptions that are ridiculous to Western people. Making the scammers visible and also mildly humili humiliating them is one of the uh, objectives of the scam baiters. Are you with me? But the humiliation, I mean, I can try to, to find the website. Um, the humiliation, I think I have it here. Yes, this gives you, um, this gives you a, uh, an example. This is a scammer, and in order to collect some money, he's been asked to put up a sign. And that sign says, welcome to the trophy room, which unbeknownst to him is a part of the scam baiter's website. And the fact that they're able to succeed in getting this man to do this is part of the fun of scam baiting. Scam baiting trades on the humor of this kind of, of display. You can, in my opinion, this is not particularly humiliating. Compared to pedophile hunting, it's very, very mild. But this is, seems to me to be one of the side issues that is involved in scam baiting. The main thing that's involved in scam baiting is getting scammers to waste their time on a scam baiter instead of using their time to be scamming. Are you with me? And the secondary um, objective of scam baiters is to form a community in which the humorous way in which they, um, they trick the scammers is itself something that's shared for general amusement and also for, for getting status as a bit of a comic genius. If you look at the communications with scammers, if you look at the communications with scammers, am I out of time? No? If, if you look at communications with scammers, you'll see that, that scam baiters use a lot of in-jokes that would be recognizable to people in the same culture as them, let's say people who watch popular television in the UK, and that mean nothing to the scammers in West Africa. And the humor of these communications is appreciated by other scam baiters, but is lost on or completely unknown to the scamming targets. And that's scam baiting. So, my, my claim about scam baiting is that though it is a kind of digilantism, it is a very mild kind of digilantism. The harm it does is very slight. Um, I'll come to, to an objection to this position in a second. But generally speaking, it's a sort of digilantism, cum, I use the cum, the Latin cum. Um, it's a kind of digilantism, cum, uh, stand-up comedy or online stand-up comedy. Not very good comedy, but comedy that anybody could appreciate. This makes uh, digilantism in the form of scam baiting morally very harmless. And it seems to me to be a very unusual kind of digilantism of the kind that we've been talking about today. I see no reason why scam baiters have to join forces with the police uh, they might, but it doesn't seem to me that their activities have to be constrained, particularly by the law. That means that not all forms of digilantism uh, deserve to be treated in the same way. Um, let me just end with, um, with an objection to my position. Yeah. Yes, this is an interesting, this is an interesting uh, uh, objection that's made. If you look into the sociology of scammers in West Africa, um, 
scamming as an activity is quite respectable. I mean, it's respectable in the way sometimes that gang leaders in organized crime are I idolized by other people. So there's a kind of cult following for scammers, and they're regarded in West Africa, in both Nigeria and Ghana, they're regarded as rather glamorous but criminal types. But their criminality is regarded as very mild. And why is their criminality regarded as very mild? Because the targets of the criminality are uniformly uh, rich, greedy people from the West or rich, greedy people from the colonizing countries. Uh, so there is a kind of undercurrent among the self-understanding of uh, scammers that what they're doing is perfectly appropriate given the moral failings of the people that they are up against. Um, it's as if you've got the West Africans getting payback for the period of colonialization. That's how scammers uh, represent their exploits to people who care about its morality. And that's uh, 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 brought, brought out in videos that are made by scammers about scammers in West Africa. Um, targets of scamming are not regarded as very vulnerable or very harmed. Um, now, uh, when, when uh, 419 Eaters makes fun of people from Africa, is that, so to speak, reenacting uh, colonializing attitudes. Um, I think this is a disp disputed question. Five minutes. I'm, I'll be finished before that. This is a disputed question, but I think it's very implausible to say, it's very implausible to say that the, the, um, the practices of, sc <coughs> of scam baiters have any uh, colonial overtones. Um, there are many scam baiters that operate in other English-speaking countries that have no connection with colonialization. They're not treated any differently. It's just that the 419 scam is a Nigerian scam. So I think the idea that there's some special, you know, uh, retrograde political undercurrent to this kind of activity is doubtful, uh, just because of the range of scam baiting activity. Um, and that's basically what I want to say. So just to summarize, I want to say scam baiting is extremely interesting as a kind of vigilantism because it's relatively harmless by, by uh, comparison to most other forms of vigilantism. <coughs> it, it also uses um, the tool of humor, which is not very widely seen in uh, the other forms of vigilantism we've been considering. Of course, the, the, the form of humor is quite low humor. It's quite in jokey humor. It's, it's got some slightly objectionable undertones. But generally speaking, in this space, it's quite harmless. It's quite innocent. So I guess I'm proposing that there are at least some kinds of vigilantism that are innocent kinds of vigilantism. That's one kind of conclusion. And I also want to say that this kind of uh, vigilantism is not to do with the weaponization of vis visibility. It's to do with the weaponization of frustration. That's it.